was certainly a lukewarm welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Listen to my directions. If you're concerned about the drug or alcohol use and abuse and deaths associated with young people and youth, please stand up. Stay standing. If you're not standing yet, and you know of a particular current student or an alumnus, alumni of your school who's had troubles with drugs or alcohol, please stand up. If you're not standing yet, I don't know why you are. Sit down. Here's a disclaimer. I don't work for any drug testing company. I don't get a reduction in our school's cost by a drug testing company. I'm not even going to tell you who we use. And I'm getting no honorarium from Lou and Paul. As a matter of fact, I had to pay for my own gas to come up here. <laughs> so that's the disclaimer. I ain't getting anything for doing this. I'm doing it because I believe in Catholic schools. I think what they're doing as sports leaders is fantastic. Let me try to frame the problem for you. I think most of what I'm going to tell you is true. You may have heard of this. A Rotary Club in Miami Beach one week asked all the participants to turn in a $20 bill. And they gave them a receipt and said, we'll get it back to you next week. They took it, had all those $20 bills tested, and 96% of them tested for drugs, usually cocaine or heroin. CNN did a similar study with a, a random group of currency, and 90% tested for drugs, uh, usually cocaine or heroin. You may have heard of this tragic story. I think it happened in January. A seven-year-old girl was in Cincinnati's Children's Hospital, I think to the west of where we are. They came in, they found the mother on the floor with a syringe in her arm, dead from an overdose. He found the, doc, the dad in the hospital with a syringe in his arm. He recovered. In Louisville, my hometown, maybe like your town, they're starting needle exchanges. The health department is now providing that drug that reverses the effects of a heroin overdose free of charge to schools. In U.S. high schools, High school students in America smoke pot more than tobacco. 68% of seniors, seniors in high school in the U.S., believe that pot is safe. One or more of you are here from Colorado. I understand that after marijuana was passed to be legal for adults, since that time, the number of teens entering into treatment programs for pot addiction have tripled. Google watch a YouTube version of PBS's Frontline episode that was just on a couple weeks ago. It talks about the opioid to heroin addiction. It is, it is stark. Courier Journal, my hometown newspaper a few weeks ago talked about the entry age for the first use, the illicit use of alcohol has now moved to 12 to 13 year olds. My hometown newspaper just today, if you just open your eyes, it's, it's pretty easy to find this stuff. Front page story in today's Courier Journal, Obama, the scourge of drug abuse is a public health problem. He was speaking at a conference yesterday in Atlanta. He said the most important thing we can do is reduce demand for drugs. And the way we, re we reduce demand is providing treatment and thinking about this as a public health problem and not just a criminal issue. Article goes on, goes on to say, across the USA, more Americans die every year from drug overdoses than from motor vehicle crashes. 2014, drug overdoses killed 47,055 people, the highest number on record according to the Centers for Disease Control. The majority, around 28,000, involve opioids such as prescription painkillers and heroin. In fact, heroin-related overdose deaths have 
more than tripled since 2010. In 2014, Kentucky, we usually lead the nation in sin, <laughs> had one of the highest rates of drug overdose deaths in the nation, 24.7 per 100,000. Translates to 1,077 people. Indiana was 18.2 per 100,000. Opioids are devastating our communities and they are costing us lives. We cannot afford that anymore. Don't know if you read the obituaries. Usually find this at least once a week in our hometown newspaper. Today there are two 24-year-olds who died. No cause of death is listed. <clears throat> the funeral home directors I know tell me that usually means suicide or an overdose. Both being buried out of Catholic churches. One other thing was in my hometown newspaper today. Big article on where to drink mint juleps this derby season. Mint julep is a terribly tasting bourbon based drink that's sold at <laughs> Church of Downs on Derby Day. Colonel Goldman, heard of him? He spoke at Global two weeks ago at a great big fundraising event. 2,000 people raised uh, three quarters of a million dollars for Catholic schools. He said he's got two great friends. One, Archbishop Kurtz, Archbishop of Louisville, <coughs> the current president of the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops. His other good friend is from Kentucky, Pappy Van Winkle. Happy Van Winkle is a bourbon drink. <laughs> Got a big laugh from everybody. Your town, hometown might have something like this. We have a monthly magazine called Louisville Magazine. Great big thick issue this week, this month. Derby preview stuff. I'll leave it up here. The cover photo is at a party. And somebody wearing a blue dress has got a fake horse head. And they have a beer, as they do, poked in the middle so the beer rushes out, guzzling the drink. That's our hometown magazine. If you look on the inside back cover, the same character is leaning over a toilet throwing up. Yesterday, Santiago was in town. Lou and Paul wanted to show him around town. So what they do? Took him to some Catholic schools, but also stopped by what we call the Bourbon Trail, a series of distilleries and museums to show him our great product in Kentucky. Now, I'm not a prohibitionist. I helped my 80-some-year-old father-in-law make wine in my basement. He's been doing that for 30 years. It tastes terrible. I don't know. <laughs> he moved to a condo without a basement, so we moved his little operation to our basement. And I help him. It's a great hobby. He usually gives it away, but he doesn't know that nobody drinks it. They just stick it aside and maybe give it to somebody. So I'm not a prohibitionist. I'm not against adults in Bible. In my school, last year, a 21-year-old, a 26-year-old, and a 32-year-old alum died. Two from heroin overdoses, and one at age 32 drank himself to death. All their families tell me they started dabbling in high school. A little drinking, a little pot. All were great students, never got caught, but they began in high school. My son ran cross country at my school. End of the year banquet, really, really nice. A lot of nice awards, a lot of great accomplishments. The parents of seniors were the organizers of it. And at the end of the evening, they gave away parting gifts to the seniors and to the coaches. Very, very nice. You've seen it done many, many times. Guess what they gave them? They gave them a pen so they could sign each other's gift. It was a miniaturized.
miniaturized version of a wooden bourbon barrel lid. Good afternoon. Do I have your attention? I don't know why Lou and Paul asked me to speak about this really riveting, upbeat kind of <laughs> topic today. Um, I have known Paul for a long time. That car that he mentioned I sent way back in the early 2000s, well, my son's team beat his son's team. He was the coach of their team. I didn't write the car. It didn't make him feel better. He had a really good son. I was trying to secretly recruit him to come play at our school. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the sports leader and this drug and alcohol testing, trying to marry the two together. I have been the president of Trinity for a while. I've been there 34 years. I've done a variety of things. I've taught religion almost every year. I've been there usually scripture classes. I've been a coach, an activity moderator, campus minister, disciplinarian, development director, and then president for a while. We were begun by the Archdiocese of Louisville in 1993. We entered into a sponsorship agreement. We have still really close ties with the Archdiocese. Archbishop Kurtz was just at school last week for a school mass. We're uh, experiencing, enjoying a really great academic renaissance for the last dozen years. We keep setting new marks for various, uh, various results. For the last three years, our ACT scores are higher than any other time in our school's history led by a great principal. <coughs> Sports are a huge deal. We're a Catholic school, right? Huge <coughs> deal. We've had graduates play in the NFL, Super Bowls. We've had graduates in Major League Baseball, pitch in the World Series. We've had athletes in the Olympics. One of our alums ran U.S. swimming for a number of years. We've had alums who are making a living in sports broadcasting and coaching. We offer more than 20 different sports from archery to wrestling. Our football team, according to a number of polls, were national champions in 2002. The other polls named Don Bosco in New Jersey as national champs. Somebody from Don Bosco called me a few weeks before the state finals and said, look, I think we're both gonna win. We got somebody who will rent out Yankee Stadium. It's gonna be set up for the pinstripe bowl what if we get our teams together after the season and settle it that way? The state federations wouldn't allow that to happen. We wouldn't do it anyway. But something else interesting happened in 2012. Besides winning our state championship in football that basketball season, we also won the state championship in basketball. In Kentucky, we've got one class, one winner out of 290 schools, one of the last states to do that. We were one of four schools in the nation to win both football and basketball in the same year. Pretty big deal. First time it had ever been done in Kentucky. Here's something interesting about those two teams. There was one guy on both teams. He also ran track. He was a four-time 200 state champion in the 200-meter run. Three-star athlete. Played in the U.S. Army All-American Bowl was courted by all kinds of schools, Oregon and Florida and Alabama to play football and all that stuff. Rock wide receiver in football, point guard in basketball, track star. Settled on going to U of L. It was a real moment of pride, spring of his freshman year in college, to hear that he had been arrested for a big pile of pot in his dorm room and a scale. Now, maybe he really wanted to very carefully measure out his joints. That's why he had the scale. <laughs> Could he have been as successful as a high school athlete while he was with us and never smoked pot and only started because of terrible influence of fellow college students? leave that to the side for just a second. Who here has a mission statement as a part of their organization? Yeah, yeah. Can anybody stand up and tell the rest of us what your mission statement is, word for word or verbatim? Now, we're all Catholics, so you have to, we have to trust you're telling us the truth. Can anybody say their 
mission statement, word for word, I'll give you five dollars. Go right ahead. Go ahead. Now you can you know you can play with this as much as you want. <laughs> Just give us a mission statement, word for word. With God, we form Christian people, upright citizens, and academic scholars. And where do you work? Notre Dame Prep, Michigan. How about that? <laughs> we were begun in 1953, and you know we had a philosophy and all that sort of thing. In 1992. Uh, we entered into what maybe a lot of organizations like yours did, a strategic planning process. Now, there have been plans in the past, but this was really formal, and the school board hired this outside consultant and all that sort of thing. And one of the things he said was, you need to have a mission statement. So we all looked at each other and said, what's that? He said, well, it's, it's one of those short little statements that... Um, you know, if, if you're on the loading dock at 2 a.m. in the morning and uh, there's no supervisor around and the package comes through a little bit torn, it drives that dock worker to tape it up and make sure it looks good. Okay. So in our strategic planning process, there's a little committee formed and they gathered up mission statements from other Catholic schools and eventually came up with one. And it said something like, We want to provide a superior high school education in a caring environment based upon Christian values and the Catholic tradition. It's pretty good. And for the next 20 years, we really tried to live by that. I'm, I'm honest with you. We do strategic planning every three years. Pretty rigorous, disciplined approach. We start by looking at our vision and then our mission statement to make sure that our to-do list reflect those things. In 2013, it was time to do another update of our strategic plan. So we hired another consultant, a local guy, and he was really good, and he's like the kind of consultant that, you know, you like having. He's not real bossy and good listener. I remember in one meeting he said, um, let's look at your mission statement rolled it all out, but we got it all over the classroom. Everybody really knows it. Can't really remember it word for word. There's a lot of words there. He said, um, oh, I guess you all formed this in like the early 90s? And I thought he was a Christian, a magician or something. I said, well, yeah, how'd you know? He said, well, by the format, what are you talking about? He said, well, you have a very transactional mission statement. And that's what people were developing in the early 90s. I said, what's that mean? He said, look, what you've said is, basically, if you give us some tuition, we'll give you this. A superior high school education, caring environment, Christian values, Catholic tradition. You don't say give us tuition, but that's you're saying there's this exchange going to take place. And we said, yeah, yeah, it's really worked well. Look at all these things that we've accomplished. He said, yeah, yeah, you can keep with that, but you might want to think about tweaking it a little bit. What do you mean? <clears throat> so, well, a lot of organizations are now creating transformational mission statements. What do you mean? Well, if you thought about if a family pays you all this tuition, invest all this trust in you, what are you going to do for their son? Well, we're going to give them a really great high school experience, caring for them. You know, what are you, what are you going to, what's going to change to them? It took me three years to really understand what he was talking about. That's when I went to the Bruce Springsteen concert at Gold a few weeks ago. Anybody here a Springsteen fan? Yeah. Wow, aren't you? <laughs> He started his concert with a song, stopped in the middle of the song, and he said, are you ready to be entertained? And all young Marina yells, screams yes, and he says, are you ready to be transformed? Are you ready to be transformed? It's the first one I've ever gone to. I understand there's this whole cult of now Springsteen people for 40 years. I'm now a member. <laughs> 
student comes to your school, school in your diocese, are they transformed? Are they changed? So we kicked around a lot of different words, thought about it a whole lot, got a lot of input from students and parents, even sent it down to Archbishop Kirk and said, what do you think about this, this wording? So three years ago, we rolled out a new mission statement that we think speaks to more of transformation than a transaction. The mission statement is, Trinity is a Catholic college preparatory high school forming men of faith and character. We're a Catholic college prep high school forming men of faith and character. Now, if you put that out there and say, we're going to form men of faith and character, is it just going to be a paper chase? Or are you really going to be transforming people? <laughs> There were some people who really liked our old mission statement. It's a little bit easier. But to say in the experience I have with us, it's going to transform them, not only intellectually, but also spiritually and morally, kind of raises the bar a little bit for us. One of the things that we did to put together our next three-year strategic plan was to say in all the to-do areas of our different pieces of the plan, do they reflect this challenge? One of the areas is athletics. Now, it's not like we were terrible people for 60 years. I mean, we've done some good things. I coached in the early 80s with a Severian brother in soccer, and I learned a whole lot from Brother Charles. He was a great man. We used to troop out 40, 45 guys on the soccer team. Why? Because he was too kind-hearted to cut anybody. They all made the team. And I saw how he treated people and prayed, and I learned a lot. So it's not like we've been doing things weirdly until we redid our mission statement. As a matter of fact, in Kentucky, our high school athletic association gives out an award to schools who don't have a coach or a player ejected. Red cards in soccer, too many technicals, you know how that works. Well, I think for six of the last seven years, we've not had a player or a coach ejected for enforcement by conduct. And of the 287 schools, I think we're one of 10 who can make that claim. We try to hire good people who treat kids right and all that sort of thing. But in trying to move this transformative mission statement into the life of the school, we wanted to make sure that we touched every aspect. It was just at the time, God works these ways, we were having a new athletic director. He had been at school for a long time, a coach, his kids played sports, just a great faith-filled man himself. Not Catholic, but still really, really spiritual. So we talked and I said, Rob, how can we weave this together. And one thing led to another. We had been talking to Paul and Lou about sports leader and that sort of thing. And I've been in administration a long time. I get a lot of stuff emailed to me, sent to me that are packaged things, wanting me to buy something. You know how that works. Well, because of the relationship I had with Paul, we gave him a little bit more listening. I said, maybe we can add some of their ideas and programs into what we're already doing. I really like this idea of having one point person. You know, if you don't have somebody cracking the whip, it ain't going to happen. And we had a teacher and a coach who I said to Rob, he's got what we want. So we approached him. We didn't even call it the director of sports ministry the first year. I don't know we know what we call it. We've now started calling him that. And that's one of the values of this conference, we can get some common language. 
So we approached Stephen and said, look, you've been doing this already. My son played for him. We want you to take this and help other coaches understand it. And he's here. He's participating in this. Stephen, would you stand up? Our Director of Sports Ministry, Stephen Thompson. I love the ideas of working in a virtue component, mentoring component, ceremony component, Catholic ID. But again, it's not like we haven't been doing that stuff, but we certainly have been able to improve it. And as uh, Paul said, we had a uniform ceremony last night with the nine seniors on the baseball team and their nine dads. Really, really potent, powerful. Set that aside for a second. Drugs and alcohol. You might work in a school, a diocese, where young people make absolutely no mistakes with drugs and alcohol. Let me tell you about my school's journey with alcohol and other illegal drugs. If I go back to the 70s, we had a great priest who was principal. And he was uh, just a really kind, insightful man. And he said, you know, we catch somebody drinking at a game, whatever, you know, we slap them in jug and punish them and sometimes kick them out. He said, but what are we really doing for them? So he introduced, along with the one counselor we had in the 70s, this idea that Maybe it's a disease process. Maybe we can arrest something early on. Not take away the discipline, but also if the family is willing to work with us, require counseling and maybe treatment and things like that. Zoom ahead to today. I can name two dozen initiatives we have in terms of drugs and alcohol that deal with education, prevention, and intervention. Not counting the drug and alcohol testing. For example, Big active alumni association, faculty gatherings, fundraising events. When we have an adult event on campus, there is no alcohol. Amen. None. Amen. Prom was a couple weeks ago. We always have prom around Durban or at, around St. Patrick's with the Trinity Shamrocks. It helps spreads out all these end of the year risky events. When the students came to the prom and their date, they had to breathe into a little device that was a breathalyzer. You might use those too. Health, PE, electives, all kinds of things that deal with drugs and alcohol. But yet, even with all these two dozen things, we still were having guys violate our policy, come to the Trinity Sanders game drunk, have these alums that die shortly after they're with us. So there was this nagging, nagging feeling of, what are we missing? So we started learning about drug testing. It really started for me as president about 10 years ago because I started getting cold calls from these companies that do drug and alcohol testing. And they were involved in other Catholic schools and I, I was not interested whatsoever. And I don't know exactly why. I think one of the motivators was fear. What would we learn? What would it say about us? What would people think? But thanks to others in my school, they kept saying, let's learn more about it. Let's don't be afraid. So we started learning. We spent five years <coughs> learning. For example, we hired a company that we used to do a market survey of 900 families in our community who had middle school students. They didn't know who was asking the question. We knew they were parents with kids in public schools, parochial schools, and private schools. 900 families. And we asked them questions. Are you worried about your child once they get to high school being involved in drugs and alcohol? Oh, yeah. What if the school that they had had a drug and alcohol testing program with these consequences that look like this? What do you think? More than 9 out of 10 said, yeah, I'd really like that. We brought in all of the drug and alcohol teenage substance abuse counselors from our city sat them down at a table and said, we're thinking about doing this, what do you think? We conducted forums with parents, our own parents. We did a lot of talking with our counselors. We have a large counseling staff and our campus ministers. Uh, 
principal and I even sat down with student leaders and said, what if we did drug and alcohol testing now? I don't think any of them are going to raise their hand and say, oh, I think that's a terrible idea, Mr. President. What they did say was, well, if it's for everybody and nobody gets excluded and it attempts to help them, then we can see why you would do that. I spent a lot of time talking to other Catholic high schools in America. There's a growing number who are doing this. Is anybody in here from a diocese or a high school that does random alcohol and drug testing? What school? Boylan Catholic in Rockford, Illinois. Okay. Saw another hand. Coming Catholic. Ascension Catholic in Dallas, Louisiana. Lansing Catholic, Lansing Mission. We talked with or went to places like LaSalle High School in Cincinnati, um, St. Ignatius, St. Edwards in Cleveland, St. Patrick in Chicago, Rock Curse Jesuit in Kansas City, Christian Brothers in Memphis. Just heard of these other schools. It's a growing kind of program. One of the two most compelling reasons why we added this a year ago. Here's one of them, I'll give you the other one in a moment. Was the conviction we had of what we learned that the longer you can delay an adolescent from using an addictive substance, the better chance they have of not being addicted as an adult. Tobacco, alcohol, drugs. The longer you can delay them using it, the better chance you have of them being an adult without problems. 90% of adults in treatment programs in America say that they started using something in high school. Remember, my three young alums dabbled in high school, and it blew up on them in the 20s and early 30s. I can answer some questions about how we do it and that sort of thing, but let me give you some other pieces of information. So it was a week after Derby last year we announced this. started in September, a random pull out of some students every week, do a little snip of their hair, test it for drugs and alcohol. There's one test that tests for binge drinking and alcohol, there's one that tests for opiates and amphetamines and barbiturates and pot. They don't know who's going to have which test. Well, as of March 1st, we had results back on 500 of our students. Random, put out a class, tested for hair. And the test registers use over the last 90 days. So good old red-blooded American high school, lots of boys, sports important, 500. You might want to guess how many Positives we had, and you won't hurt my feelings. And you won't be revealing anything about your own school, but out of 500 tests, how many positives do you think we had? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Oh, come on, you won't hurt my feelings. 320. How many? 320. 320 out of 500? Five. Five? Well, unless your school tests, you really don't have any clue, do you? Now, you might catch somebody in a game or Drug dog might come through and it hits on their locker and they got to join. But unless you test, like us, we had no clue what we'd have. That was part of the fear. Well, as of March 1st, of the 500 we tested randomly, negative, nothing, 482. But 18 positive. Now, was it always that? Or did we change some behavior? because of the testing. Um, how do I feel about the 18? I feel really good about it. Partly because of the number, but also because we found 18 guys who were making a really bad decision. They were clever enough not getting caught at home, we think, or at school, but we found them. Most of it was pot. Most of it was among seniors. As of March 1st, no freshmen. Now, did we enroll a really rotten group of kids four years ago? A really good group this past spring? I don't think so. 
I think there might be something about mobility and access. We'll see. Three of the 18 we tested again, 100 days later. I mean, we tested all of the 18 again, 100 days later. Of the 18, three have tested positive a second time. What do we do after the first time? First positive. We have a meeting with the parents, principal, a director of student, and counselor. We say, Mr., Mrs., or Mr. and Mrs., here's what we learned about John. Does this surprise you? Half the time they said, it really does. We didn't know. The other half they said, we suspected. Not once has a youngster denied it. So after the first time, what we say is, we hope you're really concerned about this like we are. Here's a list of resources in our community that you can go get help for your son and for you. We really hope that you do this. Now, if we catch somebody in the game, there's a whole set of other consequences. This is for that random, we just found out about you on your own out in the neighborhood, okay? Remember, if you go back to what President Obama was saying, it's a health issue. It's not a criminal issue. We've discovered some people making some really bad decisions, even though they knew they could possibly be tested. Of the three who tested a second time, um, what we do then is to say, we don't know why you're not getting it. Each of them had good grades and hadn't been in trouble, but they couldn't stop what they were doing. So then we said, Mom and Dad, what have you been doing? Well, we've been going to counseling, all three of them. Well, we'd like to believe you, but now we're having to have verification that you are in a helping program. And John, you now are only a student here. You don't get to participate in prom, whatever sport, activity you were doing. And we want verification that you're involved in a helping program. Here's some anecdotes. A pediatrician contacted us early in the school year and said, um, just want to let you know what I think about your drug testing program. Um, I had a female patient in, and uh, when I had them in, whether it's for a sore throat or a hangnail, I ask them every question under the sun. How about your parents, your boyfriend? How are you doing in school? You having sex? You haven't taken drugs? So I just ask them everything, they'll tell me. She said this one patient of hers said, well, my boyfriend and I have been smoking pot. Oh, really? But we're both stopping. She said, well, that's great. Why are you stopping? She said, because he goes to Trinity and he has to be tested. So I'm going to stop too. The pediatrician said, that's great. Heard, heard from a mom who had a daughter at, a friend who had daughters at a, another girl's school. She got back to us and said, uh, so-and-so's daughter and her friends have started hanging around with Trinity boys versus boys from that other school because they don't get drunk and high all the time. As a matter of fact, we're going on spring break with them because we know it's going to be safer. Our principal follows up with guys who tested positive. One-on-one, -on -one, he's that kind of principal. One of them said, um, you know, I'm really better at sports because I'm not doing that on the weekend. Another one said, I've changed my whole group of friends because they just don't get it. Another one said, I'm not going on spring break because I know what the temptations are. Connecting to sports leader. I don't think you can lead a virtuous life when you're drunk or stoned especially if you're 15 or 16 or 17 years old. I just don't think it's possible. Here's the second most compelling reason that we heard over and over again from other Catholic schools why we stuck our neck out and chose to do this. First was the scientific evidence that if 
you wait, it allows your brain to develop, and you have less chance of being addicted as an adult. That's pretty compelling. The other one was not scientific. It was the lived experience of other Catholic schools who look like us. Same kind of makeup of students, <coughs> same kind of communities. And that was in telling us over and over again that by having a random alcohol and drug testing program, it empowered their students in a way that our lessons in the classroom, our reminders after a game, lectures from parents, it empowered them in a way that superseded all of those messages. And that it gave the young person the power to say, when all of our adult voices are turned down really low and they're in social settings with their peers, to be able to say, I can't my school test. When I first heard that from the salesman, I thought, well, it's a pretty good line. Then as I did my homework and talked to principals and presidents over and over again of these schools, they said, that's what our students are telling us. I was at a church picnic in June working one of the booths like you do. And my wife came up to me later on and said, you see me talking to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so? -and -so? Yeah. Now, they'll tell my wife things, okay? I'm not in the head of the school. I don't usually hear all the kinds of things that she hears, but she tells me and protects the, the names of people. She said, um, you got to hear this story. Sherry was saying that Henry, her freshman to be at our school in June, was at a party of young teens. You know how it works. It's summer. Somebody has a party, blah, blah, blah. So Henry gets in the car and says to his mom, Mom, uh, there was pot at the party. Yeah, yeah, what'd you do? Well, I did. You mean somebody asked you if you wanted some pot? She said, yeah, yeah. I think of one thing, Henry's a pretty remarkable kid to tell his mom this, but okay. He's, she said, uh, well, what'd you say? He said, uh, I told him I can't, I go to Trinity. There were two other kids in the car. Another one who was also coming to Trinity as a freshman, another one who was going to another school as a freshman. That school doesn't test. When his mom heard the excuse that Henry was able to give, she said to her son, Colin, we've got to come up with some line that you can tell people at parties. I don't think we can fully live our mission to transform lives unless we use every possible tool there is. Great coaches, great teachers, partnerships with parents, prayer. We can't live our mission unless we use every tool. We have found adding this to our whole array of other education, prevention, interventions has been a real winner for us. I'll be glad to take any questions. <clears throat> Was there any uh, resistance to instituting the program? The um, schools I've talked to said, here's what's going to happen when you're uh, having a parent meeting, you're explaining this, you're going to have somebody be a civil libertarian and say, well, you're violating civil rights. Well, we had a parent meeting to explain all this. We've got 1,200 students. <coughs> we had 27 parents show up. <laughs> we had done our homework. I can explain to you a six-month-long process we went through to roll this out. So by the time we rolled it out, we had them on our side. And of the 27 parents who showed up, none of them complained. They were all real happy. I was overwhelmed and humbled and really felt stupid after we wrote it out and the amount of positive feedback we got from people. Felt stupid because what well, was I afraid of? 
And how many lives didn't we transform in the time that we paddled and wondered what to do? <coughs> there has been one alum who has consistently hounded me for the last year and happens to be a guy I graduated with. And Jim is a nice guy. He's a little bit misdirected. He keeps sending me article after article about the Fourth Amendment. I don't know what the Fourth Amendment says. I don't care what it says. It don't apply in our school. I'll get another call from him in a few weeks because when our news magazine comes out around spring break, my column in it is about these results I've just shared with you. So he'll call and tell me it's still wrong and done that sort of thing. There are 10 Catholic high schools in the metropolitan area of Louisville. One in southern Indiana has been doing drug and alcohol testing for, this is their third year. There's one in Bardstown, Kentucky, the Kentucky Holy Land down near Gethsemane and that sort of thing. They've been doing, um, that's what we call it, the Kentucky Holy Land. Um, they've been doing alcohol testing for over 10 years because the schools in their, in their county have been doing it, so they've been doing it. So there's, there's eight other schools in the Louisville Arts Diocese. None of them would touch this. We shared all the research we got. They didn't feel comfortable doing it. I think one is going to announce <coughs> this spring that they're going to do it. We had done so much homework and prepared our people so well and built consensus inside the school that the opposition has been nil. Another thing that God was doing to look out for us, so it's a week after Derby last year. It was a Tuesday afternoon. We had this big rollout, hired a PR firm to get all this information out to us, sent letters to Catholic grade school principals and prospective parents in the archdiocese and all that sort of thing. Um, on a Tuesday afternoon, we took the freshmen into one room and talked to them. We took the sophomores and juniors in another room. The seniors, they didn't care. They were leaving in two weeks. I was the one who got to speak to the juniors. So there's 300 of them in front of me. That's a nice spring day. Derby just finished. And now you're telling me for my senior year, I'm going to be drug tested. None of them raised their hand and objected. That'd be a dumb thing to do with the president of the school, right? <laughs> I was wondering what was going to happen that night on social media, things like that. Nothing. There were some flyers on our school doors the next morning. Very well done, put together. It was the picture of a high school boy with a kilt. And it said, Trinity students, fall 2015. Sacred Heart, going co-ed, no drug testing. It was a girl's school just down the road. And so my sister had a little fun that night creating a good, good laugh. The opposition didn't exist. A lot of positive feedback from the media. If there was a complaint, it came from places like um, those who the, the paper would find and say, well, drug testing does no good, blah, blah, blah. Our enrollment wasn't impacted. We actually had the largest freshman class of all the schools in town this school year. It's on par to be another strong freshman class. But beyond all that, I think we're I think we're impacting some lives. Yes, sir. Two questions. One third possible. What do you do? Most of the schools, and, and the policy that we have mirrors what other schools are doing. Those of you who have it, it might be similar to what you all do. Um, most of them told us, or all of them told us, you'd have very few positives to begin with, and then even fewer second positives. And they reported, we never have a third. Our policy says, if you have a third positive, and, and understand it's, once you test positive the first time, you're on our list to be retested every 100 days until we say no. So it can it span several school years. OK? 
Okay? So if somebody tests positive today, we'll test them again in another 100 school days. Well, we don't have enough school days. So when they come back in September, guess what? They get tested again. And that's going to cover the summer. So schools like us, they do this. They don't really find too many seconds. What we say on a third in our policy is, if you've tested positive for a third time, we're going to say, mom and dad, drug counselor you've been going to, let's have a meeting. What is going on? And really, if the drug counselor says there's no cooperation, he misses meetings, he's beyond help, he's gone. But if the counselor says, look, we're dealing with an early addict, and he's trying, 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 I guess my response would be, it's the year of mercy, right? Mm -hmm. so, faculty and staff. We have them. <laughs> I think all the schools I've talked to don't test their faculty and staff. One school I talked with, I asked that question. He said, well, you know where we are, don't you? And I said, well, yeah, I know what a map looks like. Couldn't figure out what he was getting at. He said, well, think of where we are. I said, I'm not getting it. He said, we're a short airplane ride away from Colorado. I have a lot of staff who go on weekend ski trips to Colorado. They're an adult. I guess I can smoke pot, right? So he said, we haven't touched that yet. We'll be, we're right now forming our next three-year strategic plan. In that plan, it says we're going to start drug and alcohol testing of faculty and staff. It will start in the 2017-18 school year. So in the fall, everybody who works there, kitchen workers, facility workers, teachers, me, everybody, and the school board are subject to this testing. Then we gotta come up with a plan. Because one of the issues with adults is, you know, they might be on some medications that are perfectly legal and prescribed, but they might not necessarily want a boss to know it. As if the boss would really care as long as you're performing. So we gotta walk through that very carefully and get some good guidance. But I don't know of another Catholic high school that's doing drug and alcohol testing of students that's also doing adults. Are any of your all schools who do it? We did initially. We haven't kept up with it. I don't want to ask why you haven't kept up with it, but you want to share it? You can, yes? Oh, just time and resources. Time and resources, yeah. Does your school bring in the dogs? Uh, oh, yeah. Periodically? Been doing that for a dozen that, years. Because that does both students and adults. Please? That'll, that'll do all. Yeah. The question is drug and alcohol or drug dogs, we bring those in, they go through the hallways and the parking lots. They usually don't ever hit on anything. They did hit on one teacher's car one time and scratched it up. I've known this teacher for a long time and talked to the police officer and I said, uh, what do you think? He said, well, it's just on this door handle. You know, this dog is so sensitive that if your teacher went to a car wash yesterday and the guy who vacuumed out the car just came from a break and had a joint and opened the door handle, it wouldn't get on that door handle. Pretty sensitive. Yes. Um, you mentioned as far as the, the faculty, uh, drug and alcohol. I'm guessing within that would probably also be nicotine. The the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in on this specific issue, says the doesn't this doesn't say that alcohol and tobacco are intrinsically evil, but the abuse of alcohol and tobacco. Uh, speaks to, to the abuse of it. So, in a Catholic school, based on the catechism, if let's say that you had have a teacher who's who, who smokes cigarettes, or I'm sure I'm guessing a number of the faculty drink in moderation, if they tested positive, how would you handle that, keeping the Catholic ethos in mind? Nicotine is not part of the drug screen. The alcohol screen is for abusive alcohol drinking. Social drinking doesn't register. And abusive alcohol drinking can be two to three drinks per day, every day for 90 days. That will register. Or binge drinking, drunken all weekend long, 
six weekends in a row. I think our approach is going to be if something comes back positive on an employee, we're going to have a conversation. Now, think about it this way, as I have. Our employees are on stage every day. Some of them are seen by 60 students a day. If somebody is inebriated or high, it's probably going to be detected other ways than a drug test. Students can maybe skate by some when they're in class of 20. So I think there's some other indicators that say an adult has a problem. But the first time offense isn't going to be fire somebody. That doesn't seem to be adhering to a year of mercy. It's going to stimulate a conversation. We care about you. What, what's the story here? What's the impact of the program been on your athletic department, particularly with the athletic director and head coaches, as far as their ability to address this issue, whether or not it's been their formation and the formation of the young people that are under their direction, specifically as it relates to athletics? Has, been, has had no impact. The, uh, the randomness is we've got a computer program that chooses uh, five to ten freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors each week. Just randomly picks a name. We come down to the office, we have a non-academic period of the day. Three times a week it's done during that, so it doesn't impinge on English or math or science. It doesn't say who's an athlete or not an athlete. Does it provide the athletic director, the head coaches, though, the opportunity to speak to this issue in a more direct way or clear way or a different way, do you feel? If Someone tests positive, it's known to the principal, counselor, the director of students, and the family. We don't broadcast their names. We don't do that. We hope to do enough training and uh, formation of our teachers and coaches and cafeteria workers and everybody about who we are and what we're trying to do. I've met no opposition from teachers. And I did get this feedback I wanted to give you. From one of our campus ministers, he said on freshman retreat, one of the activities we do has students list all the attributes of the three main aspects of their lives, family, friends, and trinity. They list the positive, the negative, and the stereotypes. In the previous three years, they always wrote drugs and alcohol as a stereotype. I think something negative about their school. But this year, we haven't seen that once. Instead, that we're seeing them write down drug testing, my school test, and safe, and their impressions of the school. He goes on to say, a number of students end up poking their head in my office after coming from being tested. They tell me they were just tested, and again, they're seeing it as a new normal, and not a burden or intrusion of privacy, with the exception of a small missing lock of hair. I wanted to say this. Um, God was watching over us. We rolled this out at a time with an absolutely great senior class. They've been incredible leaders. And they have really taken this with a nonchalant approach. We've had more disruption in the past when we did things like years ago told them we're going to start wearing ties. All hell broke loose. <laughs> <laughs> or back in the 70s when we, when we did this, when we shut down the smoking patio, said you can't smoke at lunch. All hell broke loose. <laughs> or in the 80s when we said, seniors, you can no longer leave campus for lunch. Go across the street to Burger King and White Castle. All hell broke loose. <laughs> With this, it's been very nonchalant. But then again, how many are really going to come up to me and say, I'm really upset about your drug and alcohol testing program? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, why are you worried about that? So, other questions? Thanks for being part of this. Thanks for